Thank you all. Welcome this afternoon. I'm Maria Bernier from the Connecticut State Library. My pronouns are she and her, and I wear multiple hats as do many people at the State Library. And today I'm here as the Construction Grant Administrator. And we've developed a series of webinars and tours this winter and spring to really talk about library construction and renovation projects and different aspects and help anybody who may be embarking or interested in embarking on a project to give them some additional insight from people who have just done it. So I am going to turn you over to our wonderful presenters from the EC Scranton Memorial Library in Madison, Connecticut, who recently finished a $15 million project that really doubled their size. And there's much more than we can talk about in an hour and a half. They, they say that, they said they could talk all day about this, um, but we've just got about 90 minutes with them. As we go along, please do type your questions in the chat and we'll get those as we go. Um, and I am gonna turn you over to Laura Downs who is currently head of special projects, but who was also the interim director for part of the time this project was going on and to Lydia Holland, who's the head of children's services. So Laura, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Maria. We're thrilled to be here. Um, we do love talking about our, our project. So I joined the Scranton Library uh, about 10 years ago and I joined in circulation and then got my library degree uh, after that. And um, I've worked part-time at all the service decks in the library. And um, I also worked in the development office. Uh, my first career was uh, on Wall Street. I was a vice president in the capital markets uh, department of a uh, small investment banking firm. So um, I have an MBA in finance. So um, that's my background. So um, I'll pass you over to Lydia. Thanks. Um, so I'm Lydia. I'm the head of children's services at Scranton Memorial Library, and I um, came to Madison in 2017. Um, from the Southington Public Library and kind of joined right when the project was going to referendum um, for the last time when it finally got approved. Um, and we moved to the temporary location in 2018. Is that right, Laura? 2018. Um, and shortly after that, I became head of children's services. And that's it. <laughs> okay. Um, so we will begin. So oh, one thing we didn't try was advancing these slides. <laughs> Hold on one sec. Can you still see that? Okay. I see your initial slide just fine. Okay, great. Sorry, the Zoom boxes are kind of getting in my way here. Hold on. Laura, I sympathize. I work on a small laptop screen when I'm at home and inevitably the boxes are all over my screen and the Ooh. thing that I really want is underneath and I everybody can see my arrows zipping all over the screen. There we all go, right. looking there great. Okay. So we, um, so the, this is the original building. Um, the library opened in July of 1900. It was a gift from Mary Eliza Scranton and named for her father, Erastus Clark Scranton. They were a wealthy family in Connecticut and they were involved in railroads and banking, um, kind of the Connecticut version of the Vanderbilts, if you will. Um, so <laughs> they, um, we are proud to say that the architect of the building is Henry Bacon, and he went on to design the Lincoln Memorial. Um, so that's our, our slight claim to fame. Um, we're an association library. The property is owned by the Library Corporation, and the employees are non-union, and we work for the corporation, not the town. And we exist on a corner lot in downtown Madison. Madison's population is about 18,000 people. 
We are located on Long Island Sound. Um, we have Guilford to the west, Clinton to the east, and Durham to the north. And um, that town is about five miles wide and about 15 miles long. Um, and that makes it a challenge to deliver service to the entire town. Um, and that comes up whether it's emergency services, bus routes, um, or library services as well. Uh, we are located uh, along the water. The library is about a half mile to the beach. And um, also Hammonasset State Park is in Madison. I put 20 years here because I, I, I would not be overestimating saying that this project took 20 years. Um, there was so much planning and dreaming, cajoling, perseverance, fundraising. Um, there really is a lot that, that went into it. This is what the building looked like before we got started. Um, actually, we have a lot of mature plantings, um, you could say. And in the lower right, you can see behind the original building, there's a one story uh, addition that took place in the 60s. And on the right hand side is an addition that took place in the 80s. Um, that's the one that most people say is, is not really very attractive. Some would say ugly. <laughs> When you look at the constituents of the library, um, obviously we have our patrons and our trustees, the employees, our friends group, the donors, and our typical community partners. Uh, but we also had to deal with the Board of Selectmen, the Board of Finance, Planning and Zoning, um, ACA, that's our Architectural Review Committee, the uh, Advisory Committee on Community Appearance, and also our neighbors, um, because we did have to get an easement um, from one of the neighbors. The um, library property is about two acres uh, with six buildings on it. Um, over 20 years ago, the trustees formed this millennial fund to start to raise money. And they purchased two additional properties uh, in, the, in 2002 and 2005. And this created this two acre corner. Um, and it had six properties, uh, six buildings on it, including the, the main building. And through, they, they came up with a plan in 2008 uh, that they took to referendum. And uh, as you remember in 2008, in October, the market crashed and uh, then the uh, great recession happened. There was a lot of uncertainty. And in November of 2008, that referendum failed. Um, all the fundraising stopped. The board of trustees had to regroup. Uh, it was kind of a low point for sure. And um, in 2011, the longtime director, you know, 42 years, I think she had been there, um, retired. But the library still carried on. <laughs> we uh, still were providing service. Um, nothing had changed in the building. And I mean, nothing. I'm not sure we even bought a stick of furniture <laughs> through that time. <laughs> um, the, the, the board regrouped. Um, they had a new plan. Um, they had a, this 2012 strategic plan and that included expansion goals. They hired a new director, Beth Crowley, and the buildings were designated on the state historic registry. There were feasibility studies done. They hired architects and came up with a new $15 million renovation and expansion plan. And they knew they would have to get some funding from the town. Um, and the building, as I said, nothing had been done and it was very lacking. There was a lack of space for just about everything. Uh, the adult area was really one large room um, in that lovely pink color. Um, all the studying, the reading, the computer use, reference questions, the entire collection was all in this one room. The shelving was, I call it high and tight. Um, everything was there. And the team area was one corner of that adult space. When you get to the children's area, um, the shelving was way too high, even for the staff. Um, there were poor sight lines in the room. The bathrooms were on a different floor. There was no programming space on that floor. The pro, um, this is more of the children's room. 
the programming space was uh, limited to one basement room, no natural light, and all of the library program had uh, programs had to share that one space, and uh, as well as the outside groups. There was no workspace. It was non-existent. When we got delivery, I get a little PTSD when I look at this. Um, when we got deliveries, this is what it looked like. There was no back office space to, to process um, any of this. Um, the staff area in the basement uh, was two rooms um, with no windows and the director had no office. But I say, but still, the building had hidden beauty. Um, none of this was being highlighted, um, but, but there was beauty there if you looked for it. So in the fall of 2015, uh, the library applied for a construction grant and we were awarded a, a $1 million grant. And I think for the town, uh, for the people that lived in the town and the politicians in the town, this was probably the most important moment. Um, it gave credibility to what the library was doing and what they could do. Um, and it was outside affirmation to the library. So that was a critical point. And then in May of 2016, we got an additional state grant of a million dollars. And this grant uh, was unusual and it came from a request from State Senator Ted Kennedy, a Democrat, and our state representative, Noreen Kokoruda, a Republican. And it was demonstration of bipartisan support for the library. In February of 2017, we went to referendum again for a $9 million bonding uh, for a, the $15 million project. So it would be a 60-40 split. With the, with the town of Madison. The library would have to raise $6 million. So it had the 2 million in grants, but it still had to raise another $4 million. That passed. Um, and that was um, a, a result of so much work um, from so many people. They had created a political action committee. They had hired uh, every library. They came and trained the staff and train the trustees on what we could say and what we couldn't say. Um, there, was, there was a lot of work that went into that. So, um, so when that referendum passed in February, 2017, we knew we were moving forward. In April of 2017, the Library Expansion Building Committee was formed and this is a town committee for residents. Um, there were seven members on the committee. There are seven members that the, the committee actually still meets. We actually have a meeting tonight. So <laughs> there are five uh, representatives from the town and two from the library. That was that 60-40 split that comes into play. Of the seven members, five of them, um, as I said, five were from the town. Four of them are engineers. Uh, one is an architect. One I'll call a historian slash advocate and one was a librarian. They began meeting in April and um, they're just winding down now, really. The library committee had, or the building committee had uh, cost estimators come in. They hired outside external cost estimators to take a look at what the architects had presented uh, for this $15 million project. And the project came in uh, at two and a half million dollars over budget. So obviously that was not going to work. Um, they had to take a step back, ask those architects to redesign, make some changes to make it fit to the budget. They were not satisfied that those changes could be made. And so they hired new architects. So in October of 2017, uh, we hired DRA and they are, were now and are, are <laughs> our architects for the project. I'll take a step back and talk about the state grant. And a lot of you know about the state grants, you've been awarded state grants, and there are a lot of details about that. Uh, my copy of the state contract is dog-eared. It's got, it's, it's got tabs in it all the time. And it's a document that you have to go back and look at throughout the project because there are so many pieces to it. Um, as I said, we, we got that 2015, uh, bond or application approved and were awarded our million dollars. 
We had to wait to get local funding. Um, that was secured in January of 2018. And then the state bonding commission has to meet, the attorney general has to approve, and there is an expiration date on all of that. Um, the state historic preservation office, if you're dealing with um, any kind of antique building, they have to sign off. There's a notice of contract award when you choose a construction company. The signage, there's specific wording that has to be used. The press release, there's specific wording again. Um, you're expected to invite the state librarian to any events that you have. Um, and the project is subject to state prevailing wage. Um, we had a, lo a lot of questions uh, locally about using local uh, people, um, you know, local contractors, um, and they just couldn't, they were not pre-approved um, by DAS, um, so we couldn't use them. Um, we had, you have to use DAS approved uh, contractors for purchasing, and the term purchase through state contract becomes part of your vernacular. Um, change orders have to be approved by the state library administrator. For our case, it was anything over $20,000. And the Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities, CHRO, is also involved to ensure the use of minority and female-owned businesses. Um, and there are audit and payment information reimbursements from the state um, that, that you have to, to deal with. Anyway, a lot. <laughs> There's a lot on that. Um, but Maria's great. So... <laughs> She'll help everybody through that, but it is something you have to pay attention to. To go back to the project from October 2017 to August 2018, um, the building committee was working with DRA trying to get to a point where we could go out to bid to actually build the building. Um, the building had been redesigned to meet the budget and there are a couple of things had come up. We intended to have basement space, but that basement space couldn't be used because the water table had risen and um, it was now, um, it, that just wasn't going to work. Um, the building next to the library, we were trying to save the facade. It was considered a historic building and we were dealing with SHPO on that, um, but the cost of saving just the facade of that building was going to be a million dollars. So we had no resolution with SHPO and um, we were still fundraising. Uh, we were short of our 4 million, but the trustees had pledged their endowment funds for the project so we could continue with the process, but we're fundraising as well. Uh, we had to find temporary space. Um, we could not stay in the building. It would not have been safe uh, for the employees uh, or the patrons. And um, there, the staging aspect or the possibilities of staging the project uh, were just going to be too costly and, and lengthen the time for construction. So we had to find temporary space. And there were very few options in Madison. There's no real industrial space in Madison and most of the business district is small buildings. So we viewed some of those pro properties, um, they were all small. Uh, we talked about, could we split up? Could the children's department be in one small building and the rest of the library around the corner in another? Uh, what would that look like? And what about programming? Where would, where would that take place? Uh, some of the properties were in terrible shape. Um, how much were we going to spend on finishing those out and what would parking look like in some of those. Eventually we found what was probably the absolute best space. In May of 2018, the town budget passed and we do that by referendum. And the town's contribution to the library's operating budget was cut by 25%. Um, this was based on the perception of the elected town boards that because we were in temporary quarters, uh, we would need less money to operate. Um, this was a difficult time and layoffs took place. Um, and then in August of 2018, uh, the director announced she was leaving. I was on the development committee at the time and I was asked to become the interim director. Um, I told Maria and Lydia before, I, I did hear the story that they, they, they chose me because I wasn't afraid to fix the bathrooms. Um, so, <laughs> um, but I, had, I became a member of the building committee and 
I was uh, to help the project move forward, lead the move, uh, open in the temporary space, and I was asked to join the interview committee uh, for the to find a permanent director. I was interim until May of 2019, and that's when we hired Sunny Scarpa, and she was the head of the children's library at Wallingford. I stayed on to complete the project, and that's when I became head of special projects. Um, I'm still a member of the building committee, and I liaise with the town departments and the officials, um, the construction team, and later on I led the setup and the move back to the building. The building committee is currently wrapping up its work, and I'm phasing out my own job. So. <laughs> One of my first meetings, though, uh, was at SHPO. And this is what we were dealing with. This is the building that's next, that was next to the library. And it's called the Hull Building. And you can see on the, the top in the middle, of the, it's, it's a brick building, it's a commercial building, and two stories. Um, it turns out that building is not really a brick building, it's just brick facade. So it was not in great shape. Um, and you can see on the building, on the picture on the right, where the library is to the right hand side, the windows don't line up. And the architects were trying to figure out a transition space from one building to the other. And it just became completely unworkable. We were going to end up with windows at our knees. Um, there were a lot of ramps and stairs and really wasted space. And it turned out it, it was going to cost about a million dollars to keep that. Um, so we went to SHPO, um, made our, our plea, um, and, um, and they gave us some options. <laughs> they gave us three options. Um, we chose the first. Um, we had to fully document the whole building and um, in pictures and, and in a report, and that had to be done to, to their standards. Uh, we commissioned an architectural survey of the commercial area of downtown Madison, and that was done so that any of those buildings, if any of them wanted to become part of the state historic registry, um, the paperwork side of that was done and it would make them easier to, to apply because um, it can be costly to do that. We had to make a $10,000 donation uh, from the library to the Madison Historical Society Preservation Fund. And we had to present four to six programs on historic preservation. And that was actually the part we, we we we're thrilled to do, um, and which is why we chose that, that piece. Um, the other two options were to make a $50,000 donation to the Madison Historical Society. And the third option was to fund a $125,000 archeological investigation of Hammond Asset. And that actually sounded really interesting, but it was um, obviously costly. So, so we, we were pleased to do the, the first option and we completed all of that. The second thing I did was visit the temp space. Um, we had signed a lease uh, already and it's on the property of Madison Earth Care. It's a local landscaping company. Uh, it's on Route 79, about three miles north of the downtown area. We had to install phones, IT, set up the network, you know, work out through all the, the patron computers and um, deal with all of that. So we scheduled that move for October. And um, we were a staff of 10.5 FTEs at the time. So <laughs> we, were, we were lean and mean and mighty. Um, but <laughs> um, the building itself is, it's two floors. It's about 6,000 square feet. Um, the first floor is a bunch of small rooms, um, but the second floor was one large room. So we cut up this space as best we could. You can see these rooms. Um, yeah, the, the second floor, we put all staff up there. We each kind of had our own little bay um, and we, we stored a bunch of stuff up there too. So we're a Lion Library. So they, um, they helped us with the IT and we could not have done anything <laughs> with, without them. Um, as you notice, we 
there were there was no shelving in that building. Um, so we brought the shelving with us from the old library. Um, we measured all of it. Uh, the architects had done a floor plan and done some measuring, but they had never been to this building. Um, so they did not see those trusses um, that that cut through <laughs> where you're going to hang shelving. So their measurements were worthless. So we had to go through and, and do what we needed to do um, so that we could set up. So we closed the downtown location on October 6th, 2018. We moved in October and uh, we opened in the temporary space on November 8th. So we were closed to the public for just four weeks. Um, we used NLR, uh, National Library Relocators, and I highly recommend using professional book movers. They know what they're doing. If you're organized, it definitely helps. Um, we had to mark all of our books that were going to the temporary space, and we had to mark them with tape. Um, and the rest were going in storage. And we only took about 20% of the collection with us. Um, as I said, we were a Lion Library, so we knew that we could get books um, through them, which was, was great. The move itself uh, was um, pretty smooth, um, never easy. <laughs> Organization helps, lots of lists. Um, we had a really flexible team and um, good humor helps. Um, and as Diane from NLR says, uh, chocolate. <laughs> a lot of chocolate helps. Um, the staff was amazing and people really, really stepped up. Um, we had a lot of volunteers. We had about 25 volunteers who, from the community who wanted to help. I didn't turn anybody away. Um, if we, if they wanted to make a dump run or recycling run, um, the community wanted to participate and we needed as much help as we could. We separated items that were going to the temporary space and um, those that we were discarding. And some of the items we were taking to the temporary space that we never would see again. <laughs> we were not gonna bring those items back to the new building. Um, and then there was trash. So lots of trash. <laughs> um, we had portraits of the Scranton family. Um, and these were lovely, but they needed to be restored. Um, and they were very fragile. So they went to storage until we could deal with the restoration of them. Um, some of the artwork did not lend itself uh, to storage very well. On the left, that's actually my car. And um, <laughs> The, we have a kinetic sculpture and it's, it's hanging in the car. Um, <laughs> we took it to the temporary space because that seemed the easiest way to quote store it. Um, and on the right is a bas relief uh, panel that had been stored at the old library and never, um, it had never been shown um, that while I had worked there and we wanted to be able to show it in the new building. Here's the book drop. Um, we kept the book drop open at the old building for while we were closed so that people could still drop their books off at the old library um, and they still had access there. And then we moved it uh, to the temporary space as we were opening. We made it homey. Um, it was comfortable. Um, and finally, we were in business. Uh, we had our first checkouts and we held a ribbon cutting and with the Chamber of Commerce, the elected officials, the trustees, the friends, the staff. Um, the, at the temporary library, we had public computers, we had a reading room, we had adult and teen books, children's books. Uh, there was a parking lot uh, and a book drop, um, but we had no programming space. So I'll pass along to Lydia. Yeah, so... <clears throat> When we moved to the temporary location, I think that a lot of the people who worked at the library who did programming were sort of used to not having a lot of programming space. We had just that one basement room um, in the old building. So we were used to kind of like vying for programming space in general. But when we moved to the temporary location, we literally had no programming space at all. Um, and so, you can see here, this is the children's room. It was maybe like, I don't know, 
the size of my living room. It wasn't big at all. It was very small. Um, you can see through the door in that middle picture, there's a little like foyer room almost at the beginning. Um, and so this whole room was one desk with a computer, um, our picture books, our easy readers, um, and that little small room in front was for junior fiction and new books. Um, we didn't have any extra space even for a story time, um, you know, no matter how small it would be. So that meant that we really had to look outside the library. Um, you can see how full kind of that room became, even with only 20% of our collection. Um, we had to leave a lot of stuff in storage. Um, I'll probably come back to that at some point because that was like a whole other um, problem that we kind of ran into. Uh, Laura and I have talked about the things that we would do differently. And one of the things I would do differently is to really look at our collection before we moved. Um, so I'm gonna finish up with programming and then I can kind of talk about that. Um, we really did have to look outside the library, which meant that we needed to um, form relationships with um, groups in town that would allow us to use their space for programming. Um, Laura, you can go forward, I think. The next, oh, these are our, <laughs> that's okay. The, these are our little book displays. We also had no room for displays. So we had to get really creative um, and use the tiny, tiny space that we had to display our books. Um, in the next slide, we went to places like the farmer's market for outreach. Um, I did a ton of outreach that summer, which was great because I was outside on a Friday afternoon. Um, but it was also interesting because it was me and then usually one of the um, trustees or one of the people from the board who were there fundraising, um, which was great to get our um, like faces out there so people could remember that we were open. Um, people did not think that we were open. <laughs> for quite some time when we moved. Um, they thought we had just shut down for the year that it was supposed to take um, us to move into the new building for the renovation to happen. Um, and so Laura had mentioned at the beginning that Madison is this kind of like long town. And we had just moved to that north part where we really hadn't done a lot of outreach or programming before. Um, so what happened is the people in North Madison started realizing we existed while the people closer to the water thought that we didn't do anything anymore, that we weren't a library anymore. Um, and so we did a lot of outreach at places like the farmer's market, which is in that southern part of Madison um, towards the water to make sure that people knew that we were still open and available um, and also that they could still donate money to us because <laughs> we were still fundraising at that time. Um, we also partnered with a lot of um, community ch like churches. So this is the um, first congregational church in Madison. We did a lot of trivia nights there. Um, our adult programmer, Rachel, did a lot of her programming with them. Um, we also did, Laura, you can go to the next slide. We also partnered with uh, Meg's Point and Hammonasset. So a lot of programming just with, um, you know, popular places in the community that people knew about, people would go to, um, and that we could kind of use all their big open space um, for our programs. Um, in the north part of Madison, we partnered with North Madison Congregational Church. And also we partnered with Madison Earth Care. And Madison Earth Care was um, where the temporary property was. And it was like a totally new kind of partnership for us. Um, as a library, we generally don't partner with for-profit companies. Um, we might hire them for a program, but this was definitely more of a partnership than just hiring people for programming. They allowed us to use their space. They did do programming for us, but we also were able to use, they have some beautifully, like beautiful garden space outside. Um, and we used that a lot for children's programs, for outdoor story times, um, for, um, you know, crafts outside, for seasonal, uh, programs. And if we didn't have them, I think that it would have been really hard to 
um, provide the level of service that we wanted to while we were in the temporary location. Um, there was a lot of, it was the best programming space for us because I didn't have to put everything in my car and bring it to a different location. I spent a lot of time in that temporary location, lugging things down the stairs to my car, putting them in the car and then driving somewhere else. Um, this is an example of one of those programs. This is North Madison Congregational Church. Um, we partner with the high school to do an instrument petting zoo every year where they bring small instruments for the children to play. It's very popular, um, but this is the kind of, this like lower basement um, first floor area is where we were able to program the most with them. Um, it was a nice open space, but I would have to, drive across the street basically to do any programming. Um, and so there was a lot of carrying books up and down stairs and craft supplies and things like that. But even though it was kind of a pain <laughs> at the time, um, Laura knows that the summer before um, we moved back to the regular location. So summer, we moved in July, 2020 back to the regular location. The summer before that, for summer reading, I was eight months pregnant. So I would bring all my stuff downstairs, put it in the car, drive somewhere, and then like waddle my way in with all these books and crafts and things like that. Um, we were so excited to move back to the regular location where we had a dedicated programming space, but we couldn't have provided the level of service that we did in the temporary location without partnering with people in the community. Um, we would have just not had programs. And that's the last thing that we wanted to do because when you're sort of out of that downtown area where people are not really sure what you're doing and when sometimes um, people in the community weren't really sure why we were building the new library, like if, if it was really necessary, having programming and showing how important it is for the community to have their librarians, um, made people excited to see us come back, I think. Um, and it also opened up the door to North Madison. Um, it was a place where we hadn't really done a lot of programming before. A lot of North Madison residents feel very cut off from the rest of the town, even though it's not very long. Um, it's not a huge time difference. Um, it's still very different in terms of, as Laura was saying, like the kind of services that they get in North Madison. Um, and so it's allowed us to, now that we're back in our regular location, to be mindful of the people that live in North Madison. Um, we still occasionally partner with community partners in North Madison to provide programs. And we are currently looking at um, doing some sort of like mobile um, library uh, to that North Madison area. Um, so that people can check out books and return books and see our faces without having to come downtown all the time. So that's my programming spiel, how important programming is for libraries. Um, I'm gonna go back just a little bit to the moving of the books. Um, we stored 80% of our books in a storage facility that was meant for storing books. So. It's, you know, I think Laura probably knows more about this, but they keep it at the right temperature and things like that. But if you don't weed and look at your collection before you pack them up and you pack up moldy books, when you open those boxes, those books will be moldy. <laughs> and I think that was um, definitely an issue for us, luckily it wasn't a huge issue, but if I could go back um, and if you're ever thinking about putting a large amount of your books into storage before you take on a huge renovation project, weed your collection first. Um, because not only do you not wanna store books that you're just gonna have to toss anyway, um, you don't wanna come back to a brand new library and then have to weed the whole time. Um, because I know, I love to weed personally. <laughs> it's one of my favorite activities, but a lot of librarians do not like to weed. Um, and it's not like as fun as doing a story time or anything like that. You wanna be able to focus on, um, you know, 
setting up your beautiful new space. And when you have a ton of books that are just old and kind of falling apart, like it just brings the whole thing down. So weed your collection, weed, weed, weed all the time. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you Lydia mm -hmm. um, we're gonna go to the meanwhile um because we'll go back to we're still at October 2018 so we've moved to the temporary state space um but also in October of 2018 our bid packages went out um so the whole bid opening procedure um it has to be a public event and we were thrilled we had eight contra construction contractors who bid on our project and all of them came in under budget so we were fortunate to have enterprise builders as our lowest bidder and they were chosen so contracts were signed and the construction began in January of 2019 and once you sign those contracts, the building belongs to them. So we did not have access to it anymore, um, which is you know, something you just don't really think about. Um, but no, you couldn't just run down there and look at something, or if you're talking to a vendor about something, you don't have access unless you have their permission. So this is the, the team. So we have the Library Expansion Building Committee, which is making all the decisions. Um, the, and, and dealing with the invoices and so forth. We hired Colliers International as our uh, project manager and they um, negotiated for us. They coordinated with us with the construction contractors. Um, they checked all the invoices to make sure that the work that we were being charged for was complete um, satisfactorily. Um, and it's extremely valuable to have someone on your side who knows the language and kind of knows how to talk the talk, um, if you will. So DRA is our architect and Enterprise Builders was the construction company. We held a groundbreaking ceremony in early 2019. And that once the fence goes up, and that's what you know Lydia said, a lot of people thought we were closed because this is what they see. Um, and when we started, because construction started in January, a lot of it was on the inside. Um, and the building becomes very unrecognizable very quickly. Um, so this is that area that was the adult section, um, you know, with those tables in the collection. And it gets kind of, it, it gets a little bit scary very quickly. Um, yeah, that, that one's really scary. <laughs> um, and then things get exciting because they're starting to happen on the outside. So um, remember I said the library project had six, the library parcel had six buildings on it. Um, a couple of them were, were antique buildings. Um, a, a couple were worthless and they were torn down and Shippo didn't care. But um, this building is known as the old post office and it was built approximately 1865. It used to be on the street, um, but in the 1920s when that hull building was built, it was moved to the rear of the property um, and we were gonna move it again. So it, um, so it was kind of exciting. It's exciting to see a building being moved, so. Um, it's now located where, um, where it is today, um, and it's behind another antique building that the library owns that faces Wall Street. So the hole in the ground in the front is where the whole building used to be. Um, you can see concrete being poured, and on a construction site, when you pour concrete, it's pretty exciting. It's kind of a landmark day. One of the best weeks was when they cleaned the building. And on the, the picture on the left, you can see the difference between the clean part of the building and the dirty part. It's, it changed everything. It just lightened and brightened up the building. So people saw it and, and they did, they started to get excited. And the, that's all limestone and it came out beautifully. The structure for the new part of the building starts to take place. And throughout this time, the design subcommittee of the building committee is making choices. Um, and they're making choices about budgets and determining colors and materials and everything from shelving and desk furniture, public space seating, office furniture, tile, toilets, lighting, AV equipment. 
Um, I went to ALA that year and it was in DC and they held a tour of eight different libraries that had been built or renovated. And I took a ton of pictures and saw a lot of different options. Um, I visited as many libraries as I could, uh, wherever I could. I noticed things like trash cans and paper towel holders, catalog computers, doorknobs, uh, signage. Um, believe me, if you ask 10 different people, for their opinion, you get 10 different answers. Um, this is not the easy part. Uh, in regards to lighting, um, I was very insistent that we choose lighting that had very little horizontal surface. Um, I knew how difficult it was to keep a library clean, even with really good help. Um, and there are so many horizontal surfaces in a library that collect dust. Um, so if you look at our lighting, um, there's very little of it that will collect dust. Um, the building committee made the choice to go with energy saving equipment for, to heat and cool the building. We installed a geothermal or geo exchange system with the ground source heat pumps. We have a closed system. Uh, we have 26 wells that are under the parking lot. Uh, they're 400 feet deep. Um, they're run by electric pumps on the right hand side that's the electric pumps that's actually that community room where the hula hoops were. <laughs> that that all looks like that now um, they're electric pumps and they're run by our solar array uh, on the roof of the new addition. Um, we added as many photovoltaic panels as we could. It was frustrating to have to go before the architectural review committee um, who did not wanna see solar panels on the Boston Post Road uh, 1989 edition. It's a copper roof and they didn't wanna, we had two panels already, two old, old panels, um, two rows of panels um, and they didn't wanna see any more. Um, so we put them everywhere that we could. Um, but we've seen uh, a pretty big in decrease in our utility bills. Um, our bills are running about 30% of what they ran in the old building. And that's with the building double the size. So our, our building is about 34,000 square feet. So we're seeing 30% of our old utility bills. And we are using little to no fossil fuels uh, to heat or cool the building. Today, um, not only are we considered the healthiest building in town, we are the most energy efficient and we are a model for other projects uh, for town going forward. The building committee had regular site visits to the library, usually around seven in the morning, um, and the light is beautiful. The design committee met with the Chamber of Commerce and the town planner about doing some patio space on the east side of the building on the Wall Street corner. And we came up with a plan to create an area with tables and refurbished benches. And if we were gonna install tables, why not install chess tables? Um, from my time in New York, I used to live near Washington Square Park and I love to watch the people play chess uh, during, outside during the day. Uh, and in Madison, we had an active chess group. So we thought, well, why not? So we found sturdy tables and benches uh, that would work. So we have two separate outdoor spaces on the east side of the building. And here they're a little further along uh, in the, the project here. We had this space between the two older buildings and we were replacing pavers on the Boston Post Road side of the building. So we thought, why don't we reuse those pavers and create an additional patio area? It became apparent this would be a really poor place to grow grass. And so we thought, why not add another patio space? And um, so, so that worked. And for the past year, that patio space was covered with a tent uh, and used extensively for outdoor programming. And mid 2019, uh, this is the 4th of July parade. Um, I have my nephew with me. <laughs> it, was, it was a family event um, and we're still fundraising. Um, we, um, we used to conduct tours of the library. Anybody who wanted to come in and hopefully um, become a donor, we were happy to, to, 
to show them around with permission, of course, from Enterprise. And they had a, a group of hard hats that we could use, uh, which kind of made it fun. I took the plans and I marked them up. Um, and put them on poster board. I used to walk around with those poster boards all the time. And those are the potential naming opportunities. Um, and so we used to take those everywhere and, and show them. And every once in a while, we would receive a donation, um, which is great. And actually, our um, the pledges, our experience with pledges, um, we had a, a phenomenal uh, fulfillment rate of almost 100%. So. The work uh, continued on the outside and we were really seeing progress. Um, we rang in the new year of 2020. Um, we're still operating out of the temporary space at that time. Um, Sunny has now been the director for seven to eight months. Um, she's working on the budgeting. Um, we've worked through the expected costs of operating in the new building, um, which is a thing, you know, you're gonna run a new building and you you know, we had to make estimates on what, what it was going to cost. Um, she's working on policies. She's figuring out the new hires um, and, and what we can do in the building. So everything is oriented towards planning for the new building, which we will occupy in just a couple of months. We're planning a large grand opening party for July of 2020, um, exactly 120 years. We, we had it pinned to the day. Um, after the original opening. Uh, in addition, the trustees had planned a kind of a pre-blast, pre-opening party in April. Con official construction was gonna be done. There was gonna be no heavy equipment in the building, so it was gonna be safe. Um, we may or may not have had furniture. Um, we were gonna play all that by ear. There was gonna be music, and if they had to wear hard hats, they would. It, it was gonna be a great party, um, and uh, yeah. So, it, and it was gonna be kind of a sneak peek for the larger donors uh, and sponsors. And well, we know what happened. Um, the world changed. This is actually my daughter in Brooklyn um, in March of 2020. Um, the library services at the temporary space uh, closed um, along with the rest of the state. Fortunately, construction was deemed an essential service and uh, most of the staff uh, went home, and, but I could go to the construction site, um, and that actually was buzzing along. By the end of March, we had shelving. Um, we used PSI for our shelving, and they were by far my favorite vendor supplier. Um, Family-owned, Connecticut-based, um, so they were in their own COVID bubble, and they were they're very good to work with, COVID or not. Um, in April, the books were to be delivered. Uh, we were ready for them uh, as planned, um, but they were being stored in Massachusetts, which did not declare construction and related businesses as essential. So they were still in lockdown. The official end to construction took place the first week in April. And uh, so things were now up to us. Uh, the construction company was gone and we still had to create a library. Um, we had planned a few months for setup, uh, get the furniture delivered, get AV and IT set up, get phones, all of that. Um, the outdoor work kept taking place. Um, this is, and the landscaping went in too. Um, these monumental stairs, uh, had they had been removed during the 1989 edition, and we rebuilt them. Uh, the bronze light poles were restored and put back in place. The entrance is visual. It's not a working entrance. It doesn't work for the interior flow of the library. It's not ADA accessible, obviously. Um, and But we do find that people perch, they sit, they have lunch there, um, and it sure looks a lot better. And here's the details on those light poles. It's really incredible. We were still hopeful. Um, this is a picture from April, 2020. The community room is ready. Uh, we're not really sure what we're ready for. Um, here's the teen room also in April, 2020, all ready. Um, by May, we got our books. Um, they may have had to sneak them out of Massachusetts. Uh, the directives were kind of changing daily. And um, anyway, they, they brought them. Um, I do look at the man on the left with an interesting way to wear your mask, but um, <laughs> uh, 
we were finally a library, um, but I am, and I think it's beautiful, but I'm a little partial. So um, I just wanna point out a couple of the details. Um, people will try to give you things, um, <laughs> things they don't want <laughs> and things you might not want either. Um, in this case, we were very fortunate. The Schumann family is a local family with a foundation, and they very, very generously gave a million dollars to the library. Our children's room is called the Schumann Children's Library, and um, they've been benefactors for every library edition that has taken place um, over, over the decades. Um, the painting to the right had hung in the library for decades, um, but the, the other two, um, we had been notified by the family that one of the members of the family was an artist and they wanted to have other family portraits in the library. We graciously accepted, um, but did not know what they were going to look like. So we were, we were very, very pleased. It worked out beautifully for all of us. So... But there were other donations um, that we turned away and that's where your policies really come into play. Um, we rely heavily on, on the policies um, and all of our policies have been updated and added to. In March of 2019, I was notified by a friend and a trustee that a young woman from Madison um, had died. Um, Morgan was 28 and an avid reader. She loved books and she loved to recommend uh, books to her younger nieces and nephews. And there was a thought that her parents might wanna do a memorial at the library. And, I, and the, the, the next morning I woke up with a vivid image uh, of what that would look like or, or what could look like. Um, and, and I had envisioned this mural in this corner um, the space had been created when we moved a wall on the other side. Um, we moved the storage room and it left this little corner of the library with a window. Um, and anyway, it, it, it really worked out great. I spoke to a friend who was the president of the Madison Art Society about the possibility of creating a mural, which I, I knew nothing about. Um, she arranged to work with two other artists that had um, mural experience. We approached the family with sketches and some possibilities, and they chose what they like, and the artists uh, started to, to do work. They worked outside um, at one of their homes. They painted on separate panels, and they did this all the way through the pandemic. Um, they created this beach scene off the coast of Madison, and it's got sea creatures and birds, rocks, um, even Morgan's cat is in there. Um, the clouds have quotes uh, from the books that Morgan loved and that those were provided by the family. And there were about 100 people, um, mostly unknown to the Scranton Library, who donated uh, to this tribute. So, and it's called Morgan's Nook, so it's a really special spot. Um, by keeping the older part of the building as a quiet use area, we kind of allowed the beauty of that area to, to kind of speak for itself um, and, and have that shine through. This is the rotunda. It's on the other side of those monumental stairs. Uh, the plaster had been flaking and falling down. It had been covered but with netting for years. It was restored and painted in a way to highlight the detail and, and now it's stunning. So here's more of the rotunda and the seating outside. Notice the medallion on the floor. It had been covered by a rug for who knows how long. Um, the, the, it's an inlaid tile floor and it was to be cleaned and restored. And we realized that the inside of that medallion had been cemented over. And it was actually part of the original heating system of the building. And there was a pipe that was either coal or wood burning stove down below. And um, so one of the workmen had suggested, he had this idea to replace the inside of that cement area with tile from the edge of this floor. So he created a pattern in the middle and he wanted to repeat something that was already on the floor design. So you can see, and, and we think it came out great, so. As to the rest of the story, um, it became very clear we were not going to have our grand opening party, no parties. Um, everyone was operating under emergency orders. Uh, libraries were trying to figure out how to provide service and keep their employees and patrons safe. 
get cleaning supplies, plastic, plexiglass. Um, it was a bit anticlimactic, but <laughs> uh, on July 7th, 2020, we received our certificate of occupancy and the project was on budget. Uh, we continued to give private tours to anyone who inquired and we were still fundraising and probably always will be. <laughs> Um, by mid-July, we were able to provide pickup service, and by September of 2020, we uh, had in-building in appointments, um, and this is what they saw. They saw open and natural light. We highlighted parts of the original building. We have a dedicated teen area and a flexible maker space. We call it our creative loft. We have seating on the second floor, a seating and a play area in the children's wing. We have our dedicated children's program room. This is our Henry Bacon room. Uh, we restored the paintings of the Scranton family and they're from the mid 1800s and now they really stand out. Uh, we used correctional enterprises of the Department of Corrections to refinish those tables uh, on the right hand side. They uh, were original to the building and they came out beautifully. So I highly recommend them. The, you can see the transformation in the children's room. And this is what was that original adult portion of the library. Um, you can see that kinetic sculpture uh, up high above where the computer area is. Um, and that's a, a Tim Prentice sculpture. I'll show you what happens when things don't go as planned. Um, you know, we used a, used a lot of that. <laughs> Get PTSD, Lydia. We have uh... <laughs> just the worst. <laughs> We had used a lot of that bright blue color in the children's room. Um, you know, as a shoreline town, you know, the idea was that we have, you know, what, you know, what looked like water. Um, and the carpet has a bit of a wave effect where, where parts of it are more saturated than others. Um, and we picked a similar um, luxury vinyl tile, LVT. It's a great product. Um, and we picked that for the programming room to give it a similar wave effect. Um, the brochure that they gave us is on the left-hand side, uh, and that's the color we chose. But when they installed it, and they installed the color we chose, <laughs> that's what it looked like. And it looked like a black polluted sea. <laughs> and, you know, it just, obviously, they changed the color. You know, it didn't print well, but but they changed it um, at no, no additional charge. So we changed it, and we chose the sand color. So. <laughs> Here is our um, here is our cafe um, where someday when we aren't wearing masks, um, we'll welcome people to come and bring their lunch or have it delivered, um, meet somebody for coffee or lunch, bring a pizza or whatever. Um, the TV monitor on the wall is a scrolling screen and it shows the energy savings. So it, show it, it shows live what we're saving in electricity through the solar panels. Um, and also through the geo, it, it's kind of neat. Um, originally, there was going to be a coffee station and perhaps vending machines here. Uh, after speaking with a couple of library directors, I changed that um, to be flexible space. Uh, there were a couple issues. Um, I was told the vending machines are controversial. Um, the items inside aren't what parents want their kids to have. They're either sugary or bad food. Uh, the waste from the plastic uh, in the machines is unappealing to the environmental groups. Uh, and when they malfunction, it becomes a staff issue. So this director um, pointed out that they wish they didn't have the vending machines. Uh, another director said they had a coffee station and the library provides the cream and sugar uh, but it also makes a mess, and that was unappealing from both a budget standpoint and uh, a cleaning standpoint. So, so we made it flexible space. We're a downtown library. We've got lots of food and coffee choices within steps of the library building, and we'd rather partner with our downtown neighbors uh, than compete with them. So again, flexible space. 
This is our East River Reading Room, and that's named after one of the original Madison libraries from the 1800s. And their building was actually sold in 2017, and they gave the proceeds of their sale to the library project. So, and this is where we keep our local history collection. Our community space is functional, flexible. Um, people in Madison love outdoor recreation opportunities. And now the library is part of that. So the features of our building are here. Um, it really transformed everything we do. Um, we, and we know it's really about the people. Um, but, and, and we have the staff in place to, to use this space creatively. Um, in some respects with this building now, the sky's the limit. Um, every once in a while, social media is a happy place. Um, I like this one. <laughs> one of the most satisfying experiences I had uh, was on tour with a donor, Jack Davis. Um, Jack was an icon in town and he was very generous to many organizations. Before Jack died last year at 97, uh, we gave him a tour and he came in his wheelchair with his face shield. And at the end of the tour, he said, it's like man of La Mancha. He said, to dream the impossible dream and you've done it, congratulations. So that made me tearful at the time. And um, I'm just very thankful for that. So from the opening day, 1900 to last month, we hosted the governor for a press conference. Um, and this is an event that we never, ever could have had. Um, we could not have comfortably hosted it uh, before the renovation and the expansion. So, so here we are. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Laura. I am going to invite everybody to start typing questions into the chat. Uh, or, or if you want, head down to your Zoom bar and look for um, reactions and there's a raise hand reaction there so you can raise your hand and I'll call on you. Um, but I want to sort of feed you a question before we head into the to the chat questions. You doubled the size of your building. You've got this amazing space, these gorgeous program rooms, uh, lovely local history rooms. Can we talk about the staffing? You mentioned that, Laura, that it's it's about the people, about the patrons and the staff. So how did this how did your staffing needs change as a result of this new building? I, 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 Lydia probably has more of the details. I would say they changed dramatically. At the time in 2017, when the proposals were being made to the town on what would be needed for new staffing, I, I, I cringe a little bit um, because at the time, the statement was made that we would need three additional part-time people um, we had 10 and a half FTEs when we went, were in that temporary space. Um, you know, if we were fully staffed, we probably uh, would have been at 15, I think. Um, Lydia, I know we have 29 bodies. Uh, I don't know how many FTEs there are. Do you know? Um, so I would say that the majority, especially of our newer staff, is part time, um, non exempt. Um, so I would say full-time, I know in my department, I have two, it's myself and one other. Um, and then we have four part-timers and some of our part-timers are very part-time. So um, I think that's a big difference in what we kind of started out with to now. Um, when I first came to the library, we had, um, our part-timers in the children's department tended to be more like that 20 to 25 hour a week part-time staff um, with occasional subs. So like night subs who would work just one night a week. Um, I think that with the new building um, and hearing that they thought we'd only need three part-time additional staff for a building of this size um, is wild. Um, we definitely have taken advantage of being able to hire more part-time who are very part-time. So I would say like eight to 15 hours a week is more um, along the lines of like what we have now. In terms of FTEs, I feel like we have, I'm trying to do the math in my head. 
the most are in reference, right? So maybe 12. Yeah, I, I was going to say somewhere between, you know, I, I would say between 15 and 20, maybe. Um, but but it, it's a lot time? more bodies. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's definitely changed for the better. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think I... I don't want to sound cynical, um, but but some people have, you know, it's like Missouri, you know, the the prove it <laughs> thing, you know, the, people want to see it before they believe it. Um, yeah. So there is a maybe a little bit of a bandwagon thing happening. Um, you know, as I said, we are now a model um, for a, a good public private partnership. Um, you know, we have good relations with the town. Um, that was that was really important. Um, you know, we were able to do the 60 40 uh, split of the, the financing. Um, so we came through on, you know, both the budget for the building and also the um, and also the fundraising. So, um, you know, I, I think people that were skeptical, um, you know, maybe. Were a little happier. Yeah, I think people came around eventually, especially once we opened the new building with minimal staff. Um, it became apparent pretty quickly that we couldn't run it the way we couldn't provide the services that, you know, the town of Madison is really owed after a big project like this with very minimal staff members. Um, and so I do think it really has it's like leaps and bounds from what we started out with. Um, you know, Laura mentioned it briefly moving into the temporary location, having some layoffs, um, really having a very small team at that temporary location. Um, being able to hire not just more full-timers, but more part-timers has really enabled us um, to, you know, focus on our services um, and not always be kind of running around trying to just like get things to go through, right? Yeah. To work out. So, yeah. Awesome. Let's pick up some of the questions from the chat. And I'm going to apologize in advance if my internet connection becomes unstable. And if that happens, Laura and Lydia, I'm going to entrust you just to take a look at the chat and, and work your way through those questions. But starting kind of at the top, a couple questions from Chris Johnson and Waterford about um, the square footage that you started with and what you've ended up with, and especially with regard to the change in sizes in square footage in the children's room. Mm. So we, our building was about 17, 18,000 square feet uh, to start, and we ended up with 34,000 square feet. So we just about doubled the size of the building. Um, Lydia, I don't know what the square footage is in the children. Um, it's definitely bigger. Um, so I don't know exactly what the square footage that we started out with was. Um, it wasn't Christina, a terribly can get that. sized space. It just, the shelving, was made it difficult. It felt very cramped. Um, I would say that we probably at least added like, I don't know, probably a thousand square feet to the children's room, right? At least. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I can get all of that too. Um, I'm going to put my email in the chat and, um, and feel free if you have any other questions um, specifically to um, to email me because I have all of that. Um, mm -hmm. I can get it. I can get it for you because I can get it from the drawings and stuff. So, super. Well, thank you. And then popping over to Chris's second question: How much you raised through your naming opportunities? So we had um, four million dollars to raise uh, away from the state grants. Uh, a million came from the Schumans. We had another half million dollar. Uh, family um, donation. Most of the rest of that, um, I'm trying to think of the, the board in the front because we're still finalizing um, that the naming opportunity board. Um, most of those were in the $10,000 range. Um, we had a few that were above that and we did um, we did the bricks, um, but they don't really raise a lot of money. Um, we did what we called shovels, um, and we did the shovels for $1,000. And for a $1,000 uh, shovel, you will get your name um, permanently in the, in the vestibule of the library. Um, 
they're, you know, the fundraisers are great and they get the library. Oh, hmm. Well, there's a cost to that. Um, the the I'm I'm not sure the rent would make sense for the friends. Um, the we the friends actually have a a room in the building um, where they can sort uh, their books for their book sale, um, and um, and they collect the books on a porch of one of the older buildings that is on the library property. Um, so I don't know about the money side of that. There were a lot of people who said, could you please keep the temporary space as a branch library? Um, but again, that, it kind of comes down to the money. I'm not sure there's enough money to keep a, a full branch open. Um. Are the six buildings on the lot used by the library? I don't think we have six anymore, right? Nope, nope, we got rid of most of them. Um, we moved the one and so we really have two outbuildings um, now. They're both uh, considered historic on the state historic registry. And um, one of them is intended to be used for programming space. Um, we've kind of used it for staff space um, during COVID so that we can separate and go over and eat lunch over there um, inside, um, but they both need work. Um, so the trustees are trying to develop a, a plan for those. Um, so they're, they're empty right now um, and being used as, as storage and kind of flex space, I guess, if you will. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that answers the next couple of questions, like how many of the original buildings were used and what we use the other buildings for. Um, Brooke from Bloomfield asks whether we were happy with the location of the swing space and was it on a main road? Uh, yes, it was on a main road. It was on um, a main road. I think we were happy. I think we were happy with it. I, I said, I think it was the best possible space. Um, you know, it was, it, it, I think we, we certainly made it work. Um, yeah. um, yep. I'm and it's right on route 79. I don't know how familiar everyone is with the area, but it's right at this kind of circle roundabout, um, that leads to Durham and North Brantford. And, um, so even though it doesn't feel, it didn't feel as central as our downtown location, I think for a lot of people up that way, it was a lot more central, um, my commute was cut in half, loved that part of it. <laughs> um, and it was cozy. It was, it was small, but it was workable, I think, for the time that we were in it. Um, and I felt like we had more workspace in the temporary location than we did in our previous location. Mm -hmm. For me, at least I had yeah. an actual desk. Yeah. Me too. I was happy to not be in the basement. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> Natural light. Yeah. Um, I see Wendy's asking about the old staff space and are we happy with the staff space now? Yeah, it's not, um, the, the staff space, um, you know, it, it varies. Um, Lydia has a lovely office. Um, yes. <laughs> um, um, I have a desk in shared space and it's fine. It's again, not in the basement. So, so that's fine. Um, we have a, a, a very, very functional, nice sort of kitchen lunchroom area, um, you know, with a staff bathroom. That's, that's nice too. Um, so I think, yeah, our director has an office now. Yeah, she has an office. Um, and our ad admin. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and though, and that's important. I mean, that's, you know, that's just, you, you got to function. Right. Um, so, and nobody needs to know every single thing that goes on. So, right. Um, Excuse me. Do you have any tips about working with contractors? It's a question <laughs> for you, Laura. <laughs> yeah, um, definitely. Do not be afraid to ask any question and do not be afraid to, to look at every single detail. There are things I wish I had asked. I, I would have asked about different products they were using, surfaces. Um, I would have, um, you know, I, I became known as a persistent pest, um, a pleasant 
persistent pest. Um, but there were so many things that I, I'd be in a room, we'd be discussing something and there was a term I didn't know. I assumed everybody else in the room knew the term. And then afterwards I would ask somebody and they didn't really know. Um, so I was not afraid to ask questions. There's vernacular that they use. Um, I was saying to Maria and Lydia earlier that, you know, they talk about, um, um, one of the uh, substantial completion, um, you know, you, they threw around this term substantial completion. I, I didn't know what that meant. I didn't realize that that meant that that's when all our warranties would begin. And most of the warranties last for one year. So they kind of began and end before we even knew it. Um, so, you know, don't be afraid to ask any questions. Um, we, we love the contractors. Um, you know, you get kind of subs of subs of subs sometimes. And so you're a little distance. They don't work for us. They work for somebody else. So, um, you know, but, but for the most part, everybody was really pleasant to work with. Um, and they were happy to share um, what the, their knowledge and, and what they were doing. Um. How did the friends operate during the time the library was closed, but the temp space was full? That is a great question um, because I actually um, nominated them for an award um, because they continued to operate. They found their own temporary space downtown. Um, they found a really good deal uh, for a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> um, that Jack Davis that I spoke of, that donor, um, his family owned a building and um, it wasn't very nice. Um, and and uh, but they used it to collect books and actually have their book sales there. Mm -hmm. And um, and they continued to operate. Um, they were flexible. They used to do one book sale a year and then they turned out to do three or four a year. Um, they were amazing um, and continued to contribute. Uh, to the library, they, they are a major donor uh, to the project and, um, and to the operating uh, budget of the library. Um, they, were, they were amazing. Um, that's all I can say about them. <laughs> yeah, they were. And they still showed up at outreach events. Um, I know they joined me at the farmer's market all the time. I was always trying to get people to come to the farmer's market with me. Um, and so they would like sign up um, every week, a new person, um, and they were just still really involved um, the whole time, I think. Yeah. So we're lucky to have them. Definitely. Christine, I see you're asking about the sign at the construction site. There was a sign. Wasn't we there? had two. We had one on one side and one on the other, <laughs> both, both corners, um, directing people. Um, but yeah, <laughs> it was good. It was good to have. Um, yeah. We wouldn't um, have yeah, I don't think, I mean, Obviously, some people read it, but we still got a lot of calls asking about there was a lot of people confused about our location, whether we were open. Um, yeah, you can't so assign a sign is the best we could do, but it didn't fix all the confusion, I don't think. Yeah, I think you can't over communicate. We tried to get as much PR as we could. Um, you know, all the time we were in the newspaper a lot, um, you know, just reminding people what was going on. But Mm -hmm. um, how many square feet were in the swing space? 6,000. Uh, no, we do not have automatic material handling. Okay. All right. Thank you both for taking over the questions while I dropped out there. <laughs> I appreciate that. You never know what's going to happen with the internet some days. Oh, absolutely. So well, I want to thank everybody for sticking with us here. Yeah. Yes. Want to thank all of our attendees and especially thank Laura and Lydia for spending time with us this afternoon and putting so much thought and preparation into this presentation and into the uh, answers to the questions. And I know that Laura did put her email address in the chat. So make sure you save that. She's been really fabulous uh, about offering to help people and answer questions. So you can definitely get in touch with her. And Lydia, I'm sure people are going to be finding you as well with questions about children's room and children's services. Yeah, I can put my email in. Thank you so much. And we're both listed on the um, library website um, mm -hmm. too. So you can just go to the website and find either one of us. 
awesomeness. And so I am going to put this recording on our LibGuides on our website. I'm going to send all of our attendees and registrants a link for where to find that. And I think I may even have a, um, an evaluation form to send out as well in a little bit. So keep an eye on your email for that. And thank you all for being here. Thank you again to Laura and Lydia. And we'll catch you, you again for future webinars in this series. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks, you. Maria. Bye-bye, y'all.